Welcome to episode 6 of The Leap Home, Double Identity. In this week's episode, Sam arrives in 1965 and finds he is a mafia hitman involved in a romantic liaison with a rival boss's girl. When Al tells him there may be a way to leap home, Sam is able to put everything else aside and focus on that outcome. But will his disregard for the lives he is affecting matter? Or is this series about to come to an abrupt end? This is a surprise. It does seem to attract attention. Give me a razor, Teresa. A razor? Good evening, Ian. How are we? Not too bad, Jerry. How are you? <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> Were you a bit confused with that? Well, I'm not sure what language I was trying to, to speak there. Maybe when I'm not trained in. Remember we used to do different languages on one of the old podcasts? Did we? Yeah. What one was that? It's like the Star Trek one. Did right. Different episode titles and they would get abuse of native speakers. Right, okay. Yes, I'm not too bad is what I was trying to say and then I was going to ask, how are you? I am fantastic. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Well, you're probably dying of something. How come I'm always dying of something? So you say. Health anxiety, a tad, a touch off, a smidgen, it's getting worse. Have you cleared the long Covid now? That is, I do have, a just, that's over 35 days and I'm I'm back in action. There you go. Barely. I don't think that counts as long COVID. You lose it very quickly. Mm-hmm. What you've gained, what you've got. If you don't yeah, use yeah, it, you edge. lose it. The edge. Yeah. yeah, it's going to be a long struggle back uphill, I think, with this one. Yeah. Uh, right. Your edge is probably not worth well, well That's, yeah, almost there. <laughs> one yeah. foot in the grave, as they say. That's it, past halfway. Anyway, this was another episode with a, a fun aesthetic, I thought. It remind, reminded me a bit of the Star Trek episode with the mob planet. Yeah, a piece of the action. You enjoyed that one? I, well, as you know, yeah, I do love a, a mafia, a mobster, whether it's a TV show or a, a movie, I'm a big fan of it. So you enjoyed this? I did, a lot. it has its problems. Yeah, I think Sam got off a bit easy this week, he was kind of reckless without any consequences. Yeah, and the ending, I'm not entirely sure how we got there or what he was there to do we can discuss it we can before we do socials indeed snapchat no one's found that yet as far as i'm aware but people have found us on twitter and on instagram where we are at leap home podcast they found us on facebook where we're at the leap home and they found the website where we're, uh, we're at the leap but most importantly they found us on youtube yes most important because you can hear this episode a week early you're hearing it right now other folk aren't hearing it until next week. Ooh. That's obviously the Colombo Podcast Productions YouTube channel. Thumbs up, smash the like button. Yes, we've even put a fancy graphic up to remind you to do that. You say fancy. It's there right now. You're not a graphic designer, are you? In no way. No, no. People can tell when they look. Oh, they can tell. Absolutely. However, if they press the button, it doesn't matter. Matters to me. We're also putting up other content on the channel, some of our older shows. Yeah, let's talk about that while we've got a chance. Yeah, I think all of Star Trek, all of Jonathan Creek, all of Columbo and all of Faulty Towers is now there. There you go. When is Sledgehammer going up? When there's enough demand. <laughs> okay. It's like I love Sledgehammer. You do. It's only you, but you do. It's not. we a loyal, hardcore three cool. people. <laughs> yes. Anyway, shall we get back to this week's episode? Let's crack on. We begin with the now usual customary premise, a recap, followed by the credits, and then a, a recap of the last few leaps. Sam, yeah, gives his sort of mini recap and he describes leaping as being like going on a blind date. Yes. Well, in this case, very much so. There's the possibility of some shenanigans at the end of it. Well, he arrives immediately post coital in the body of a man called Frankie. Yeah, he's in an attic, on the floor with his trousers, or as the Americans would say, pants, around his ankles. There's a a New Yorker type woman, finishes getting dressed and commending him on his performance. Yeah, so he's he's restored his uh, underwear very quickly, but left his trousers around his ankles. Well, you would do, cover your modesty. Maybe she's tucked him back in when she's finished. (laughs) She leaves, and he gets up and looks at himself in the mirror. He seems quite impressed with what he sees. I was expecting more to be honest. I saw the way as, as Frankie is uh, described, he is you know, the ultimate Adonis, a male model, and he's. Uh, it's uh, not the first time the show's taken a, a character and said, Look in the mirror, look at how obviously 
beautiful or ugly this person is, whereas some of us may find it a bit more subjective. I didn't think Frankie was a particularly no. striking gentleman. No, he was alright. I thought he was a bit weird looking, to be honest. The touch of the lurch about him. Yeah. Anyhow, Sam is impressed, which is probably enough for the sake of the story. He puts on his tux jacket and with that and the, the chatter nearby, it looks like he is at a, a wedding, which is confirmed when we cut to the celebration party in the garden. Yes, the woman he was with turns out to be called Teresa and she seems to be in the middle of some kind of disagreement. Yeah, with some wise guys. It's uh, this, is a, this is a very, I was going to say stereotypical Italian affair. Lots of people shouting and arguing, lots of hand gestures and mamas and all this, papas and all this sort of stuff going on. It's clearly influenced by the wedding scene from The Godfather. Godfather, yeah. I think it's not the only part of the episode that's got some Godfather influences. Everything, every sort of mob, ma uh, mafia uh, production since then is, is influenced by it, I would say. A sensible thing to do, I suppose. Who is Teresa arguing with? It's a guy called Gino. Yeah, she interrupts a, a game of bowls. I'm not sure what type of bowls it is. It's that one where you, it doesn't roll. You throw it and it lands with a, a thud, I think. Yeah. The, the men are playing this game and she um, she bends over quite provocatively, I think, knowing what she's doing in front of them. And she points out that Gino has smooth balls. Indeed, I think she's going to refer to this shortly. He's not perhaps playing fair. She tells him that other people won't be honest with him because they're scared of him. Yes, we understand he is the, the Don or certainly someone high up in the, the structure of this family. He seems to be. He takes her then to a garage and as he goes we see another man counting some money. For the second time she uses her if I'm lying I'm dying catchphrase as the angry Gino, as you say, has to pay up. Before he takes her arm and guides her into the garage for a word. I thought when you showed up at my daughter's wedding, you want to be friends of it. I'm here because Angela asked me to be her beautician. Now I think you come to embarrass me. You're the godfather, Gino. You don't need to cheat at Bocce. That's what I like about you. You talk to me like I'm some ordinary juggle. Mm -hmm. Why don't you meet me at our old place tonight? No. Ah, oh, come on. I talk dirty to you. We'll have a good time. You got somebody, don't you? Yeah. I got a guy who wants to commit suicide. Who could I have? Everybody in Brooklyn knows he'll hit any man over 14 who says hello to me. Why don't I believe you? Why start now? You didn't believe me when I said we were true, either. We're not true. Not until I say so. Kavish. You're a piece of work, Teresa. A real piece of work. Batchy, I think it's called then. We hear the other games. Yes, that the game he's been cheating at. Yeah. Gino leaves. Teresa is visibly upset. This is the first of a, a number of times where I was very impressed by the character of Teresa and the acting. She's very good. Yeah. Throughout. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this, let's call it out, is this a form of racism? The whole caricature of the Italians and Capiche and, and the, all. The heavy New York accent. And the so. music there. It's very, it's, it, 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 at best it's hugely cliched. Yeah, certainly a stereotype. Mm -hmm. Who can say? I suppose making it more of a caricature means you don't have to delve into the realities so much. Yeah, there are a number of times where we have comic relief um, even when yeah, when we're talking about people who are murderers, yeah. killers. Yeah, but you make them more sort of affectionate or uh, lovable yeah. by taking that side out and making this, these sort of characters. Back in the garden Sam is in a, a spot of bother. Yes, he's made a, a sudden realisation that there's a skill he does not have. <laughs> yeah, there's two old woman speaking to him in Italian. One of them I think says Nonna. <laughs> he smiles and listens and he, he thinks he's out of the trouble when his brother comes over to tell him that their uh, pappy wants them to meet their cousins. Yes, they're from Philly and they're all doctors. However, there's something else 
that they want him to do, or he's, he's, uh, the, the, they want him to do. Well, I think indeed the bride wants him to sing. Yeah, apparently this is his, his party piece's speciality. And this, his brother, who is the groom, announces to everyone that Sam is indeed about to perform. What song? Well, the bride asks for that classic wedding track, Volare. Yeah, which apparently he is known for. So the band start up and he is lifted onto the stage as all the guests gather round. It's a track that's notorious to anyone who listened to the Colombo podcast. Yes. We'll get back to that. We probably. will. Fortunately, Al appears and tells him just to, to sing and he will help with the words. So this is something I wanted to discuss. We've asked, questioned this in the past. We're trying to get to the bottom of it. If Sam can sing in this body, we're certainly taking on the physical attributes it would appear to be of, of the person who he's leaped into. So you're thinking Sam can sing because Frankie can sing? Yes. If Frankie couldn't sing, how could Sam? Singing is not just, you don't just know how to sing. Anyone can learn the theory. It's a physical act. Uh -huh. But if Sam can't sing, could he perform as Frankie and get a tune? I don't think Sam is Sam can sing. So you think because Frankie can sing, that allows Sam to sing? Yes. Let's take it to an extreme. If uh, Sam leapt into the body of someone who was a mute, they would not be able to speak or sing. So you accept that, yeah? Okay. No, I'm saying you accept that. If he, For the point of this conversation. If he leapt into the body of someone who was unable to physically speak, then he wouldn't be able to, just because Sam knew. So uh, extend that logic. So he's leapt into the body of someone... So if you looked into the body of someone who couldn't sing, he wouldn't... It's all about your, your diaphragm and your vocal cords, etc. Okay. Look at that another way. When he leaps into the body, he takes on the accent, doesn't he? Of the person, so the voice. a contradiction here with uh, last week's episode. So you're saying he's leapt into Frankie and he can sing because Frankie knows how to sing. Fra but last week he leapt into a boxer and he didn't have the boxing technique. Ah, no, you see, that that's the thing. The box, he's got the boxing, we've discussed this, he's got the box, was that last week? No, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, sorry, yeah. The bo he's got the boxer's physical uh, attributes, so his, his size and his, his strength, his muscle mass, but he doesn't have, he, he doesn't know the skills. So how's that different with the singing? He doesn't know how to use his diaphragm, he doesn't know how to be use his vocal be cords. Because even if you're not a singer, you know, you can attempt, people try and sing, you might be a, Sam might be a bad singer, but he will then, he will try and sing, but he's got the, the, the vocal cords to produce the, the sounds. Along. A very, very narrow tightrope to try and justify these two things as being compatible. Mm, well, I mean, I think Sam might be, okay, I'm a dreadful singer, right? I can't sing a note at all, but maybe in real life, or, <laughs> but maybe <laughs> Sam could get by maybe a couple of tunes so he knows the basics so therefore if he's into a body of it's someone enhanced by that yeah, skill if we take it back for the two weeks if Sam was say a reasonable amateur boxer and then was suddenly put into the the body of a professional world champion uh, or a, a champion level he mm -hmm. might have enough to then say okay I know what to do and now actually I've got the physical uh, uh, I've, I've got the yeah, the ability to, to take that to another level so it's you're quite a slow runner but if you're into the body of a sprinter you could well, run fast. Well, precisely. If he jumped into you know the body to move your legs. Yes, if he jumped in exactly. If he jumped into the body of Usain Bolt, I'm sure he'd be faster than what he would be just as Sam. Okay. Because firstly, he's got the the physical attributes. He's got the longer legs, and, and all then the performance enhancing drugs that he undoubtedly has been using. <laughs> no, there's no evidence of that. Or no. Or Why would you say that? <coughs> I was going to say coaching. Oh yeah, coaching. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, yeah. So. Often track there, but I think we're now establishing that he's got the skills, the physical skills off. Have we? Have we I don't know. That? Have we? I can't I'm remember. <laughs> I'm not entirely clear, to be honest. I suspect it may just be whatever the story requires. Yeah, perhaps. Plays out that way. In any case, he's not very convincing as he starts, which is reflected in the reaction of the, the, the onlookers. But Al, he seems more interested in one of the bridesmaids. I thought that Sam might wing it and pretend to be super drunk and fall over and stumble away as if that's why he wasn't singing well yeah that would have been a, a way out can we just talk about Al as well I mean Al he is very very unprofessional here he's always and, very unprofessional yes he is but not necessarily to the detriment of Sam okay but last week he left him with the horse left him with the horse because he's got his own personal problems this is the one thing that Al should be getting sacked for this he's been placed 
here to communicate and he should leave his own personal problems and uh, issues aside while he's doing this. Yeah. Sam can get himself killed or, you know. Or get somebody else killed. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, it's all very well Al being a bit of a womanizer in his own time, but when he's here and when Sam needs him, that should be his 100% focus. Yeah. While this song is going on, we see a, a man talking to Gino about how he's lost track of Teresa for 20 minutes. So obviously she's being watched. Sam, fortunately, suddenly finds his voice and his confidence and actually ends up seeming to be enjoying himself as well as the guests, Teresa in, in particular. Indeed, which allows the episode to put him in the background a little bit and focus on this conversation between Gino and his cohorts. So Gino says that when you lose a girl like Teresa, you lose respect. And when you lose respect, you lose fear. And he tells one of his men, I think it's Adriano, his, his sidekick, his henchman, yeah. that he wants to find out who the person is that Teresa is apparently seeing and make him sing soprano. One of the other men suggests he puts Frankie on the job. But I think, as you say, Adriano doesn't want the job taken away from him. He says he'll get it handled. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure. Sam get, get too into it too quickly. You think? Yeah. Took it too far? Yeah, it was quite fun, but mm, all of a sudden he was uh, swinging around the stage as if he owned the place. Yeah, he got a bit of confidence going. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Maybe he does like to sing a bit in his own his own body, and as he's coming out, his performer. Yeah, could be. Sam then makes his way back to the attic where we first saw him. Where a sweating owl tells him that he needs to know exactly where he arrived in, in 1965 if they are to make another attempt at retrieving him. So this is exciting for Sam who wants to go home obviously. However he recalls the uh, events of the year including Vietnam which Al doesn't want to be reminded of and they both reminisce of their childhood romances. Yeah including Al's fourth grade exploits when he was 10 years old. <laughs> Al then surprises Sam by pulling out a very powerful fan. He does because Ziggy struck down all non-essential systems to try and get this retrieval to work. Yeah. Was that the Ziggy device or was it a different... It's a different device. Yeah. Right. It was a different shape. Al also at this point figures out what Sam was doing when he arrived. Which causes an embarrassed uh, Sam to change the subject by asking Al why he is so hot. Yeah. Like I said there about Ziggy turning down the systems. Yeah. So Al tells him additionally that Frankie, who he's leapt into, is a hitman, which concerns Sam. Yeah, but before we get to that, there's an interesting point. Al tells Sam that Frankie's condition when he arrived in the waiting room left little to the imagination. So I'm thinking he arrives with an erection or a... Or covered in... <laughs> anyway, let's move on from that. Yeah, the bigger problem is, uh, yeah, Frankie's a hitman. Yes, uh, but there's no data on Teresa. Ziggy's not done any research because it uses too much of the available resource. Yeah, I mean, she could have been any uh, any one of a number of girls as Frankie is clearly a bit of a stud. Sam's told that if he does exactly what he's supposed to do, there's a 97 point something percent chance that they can retrieve him. And this is the first time I think that, and I believe it changes, Ziggy is referred to as a, a he. Yes. I'll come back to that. Okay. So Sam is told that they've got to wait for precise instructions from Ziggy. And this involves doing whatever Frankie would normally do until they hear otherwise. He then points to a handgun and tells him that it is his before Al disappears. I think he normally would do what the person he's leapt into would normally do. Not if it involves murdering people. Well, anyway, we zoom ahead to the next morning, I think, where he's out on the street with his brothers, who are strangely named Primo and Segundo, despite appearing to be younger than him. Yeah, number one and number two. Yeah. <laughs> he asks uh, Primo why he married Angela, and is reminded it's because he told him to. Yeah, yeah. the other brother reminds him that it was a, a business decision to get uh, Primo as the um, the Don's son-in-law in order to move in in the Carlucci, is it Carlucci's? Carlucci's, yeah, the guys with the restaurant. Yeah, another family, yeah. <laughs> or used to have the restaurant. Indeed. Uh, yes, at this point Sam is distracted. Yeah, he spots Teresa in a hairdresser's 
across the street and decides to go in for a, a bit of a, a trim. This again seemed overly confident, arrogant, and arrogant from, from Sam. Look, why would he, he do this? He clearly hasn't taken the whole situation into account. Yeah. He's not realised that men don't get their hair cut in women's salons in this day and age. Sam's not an idiot. He should know this. Yeah. It's, an, it's like he's getting infatuated with Teresa. A bit like he did with Tess. Yeah. Even after the episode where we find out you know, about the Donna and his, his one true love. Yeah. Hmm. He immediately realises his mistake in a voiceover as he enters the salon. He does. Teresa and her clients are shocked when he asks for a haircut, but she agrees and even gives him a, a shampoo first. However, she's extremely nervous. Of course. Outside. Why, well, why is she nervous? For a start, she might get seen with him and that'll involve them getting shot. Even though we hear that Sam's father or Frankie's father once saved uh, Gino's life. Yeah, it's as if Sam now then puts the pieces together and realises what the situation actually is. Yeah, it's Don Gino that she was uh, she's talking about and he's, he's now quite worried. But the fact that he was apparently so hot for her and he took this risk is quite a, a turn on, I think, for her. Yeah, she's more into him than it seemed at yeah. the start. She seemed quite detached initially and then she's actually quite into Frankie, I think. She admits that she fell for him as soon as she saw him blow holes in the Giacani brothers at the fish market. <laughs> Indeed. Outside, what's going on? Frankie and Primo and Segundo's father have shown up in a very stylish wheelchair. Yeah, for the day. However, Gino has also turned up and the two brothers, now joined as you say by the father, have to try and think fast in order to save Frankie. My condolences on the loss of your eldest son, Paisan. But Gino, this is my idea. Well, you know how women, they talk in the beauty parlors. I mean, they say things to each other that they wouldn't tell their priest on their deathbed. I figure, well, Frankie goes in there, maybe gets a haircut from Teresa. She may, for one split second, forget that he's a man and let something slip. You live long enough, you see everything. <laughs> Even your most trusted paisan trying to slip you the salami. No. No? You think for one moment that if Frankie was buffing Teresa, that he would be sitting in that chair in that window? Gino! I swear on my firstborn grandchild. Angela told you? Frankie is not the one you want singing soprano. Swearing on Primo and Angela's firstborn touches me, Tony. It's very Sicilian. I like that. So, I'm gonna give Frankie a chance. I'm gonna ask him why he's getting his hair cut in a woman's beauty parlor. And he better tell me it was your idea. Now who's stupid up? And don't talk with your hands. So Juno enters the salon and we heard at the top of the show what he says to Frankie yeah. slash Sam. Outside, the family are gesticulating at Frankie, trying to pass on the the message or pass on the, the story they've concocted. He's not even looking in their direction and is told that if he gets this question right, all he's going to receive is a nice shave. But answer wrongly and his throat and nose will be cut. Indeed. And although it seems like things can't get any worse, they do. Yes, the question is asked in Italian. <laughs> Not knowing what he is asking her, what to say, he starts with a no and then tries Valari at yes. the last time. Before Al arrives to save him. Yes, fortunately Al is fluent in Italian and is able to talk him through the answers which ultimately match what Juno was hoping for. Or looking for, maybe better than hoping. Now, question here. How does Al know what to say? Because Al wasn't with them outside. How does Al know what the, 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 the story was? He can probably see them gesticulating through the window. He's looking that way. Mm. They don't make it clear, though. But that's, yeah, that's not clear. No. So, can Al... Or maybe, we, we do know that Al shows up before Sam sees him, usually. 
Så maybe he did see. Mm. But who knows? In any case, even though Lowell gets carried away with his explanation or his, uh, his, his Italian, which Indeed. Sam can't follow, it all works out in the end. Gino is delighted and therefore everyone else is also. Later on, outside, Sam talks with his father and brothers and is told that the only reason that Gino's even willing to consider believing him is because of the bullet that was taken. Presumably that's why he's in the oh, wheelchair. Exactly. Also, I'd like to mention that there was a nice uh, camera shot here of a reflection. Yes, you saw actual Frankie. Frankie for a while. It was well done. Yes. He needs to find the Stugazzo that Teresa is cheating, uh, cheating on Gino with. <laughs> yes, and Gino will be watching him until they find out who it is. Sam points out that Gino is a cheat himself, but this doesn't register with them. I don't think the the fact that Gino can be cheating it's like a one way thing here. She yeah. can cheat on him, but he's a he's a, a man and he's also a don. A don, so it's, that's not cheating. That's yeah, just a privilege. Sam even bringing this up. Surely Sam must realise that that wouldn't land. Yeah. Anyway, he has further instructions. What's that? He's to take Nona to the bingo. She's not one for some time. Yeah. The implication being she should win this mm. evening, I think. They leave and Al appears and tells a tale about how his Italian father and his girlfriend used to sneak out, uh, sneak him out of the orphanage for pasta and wine and one time brought a girl for his very first experience. Do we think this is true? No. No? You don't think so? No, I think Al's full of nonsense. I'm not so sure. I tend to... Why would, he, why would he be in an orphanage if his father was there to... Well, I'm not sure. Maybe back in the day, if the mother was dead, the father might have to go to work and or, 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 and couldn't look after you. Wasn't capable of looking after... Um, it sounds to me like an, at least an exaggeration. Yeah, I mean, it might have been like a day orphanage. You know, a boarding school scenario. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's just a school that he calls an orphanage. Yeah. Anyway, maybe. I don't think they introduced him to a girl either. You don't think so? No, if he's as accomplished socially as he makes out in previous stories, you mm. wouldn't need their help. Yeah, but he was only, that's what I'm saying, he, he is accomplished because he was uh, given training at such a young age. It doesn't sound likely, maybe. I, I, I'm not buying it. Anyway, using his new learned mannerisms, Sam interrupts this story and reminds him that he has to leap before Gino realises that he is the one who is doing the cheating with Teresa. Now, question that arises here. What happens if Sam dies in a leap? Don't know. Mm. Maybe it depends if he was meant to die. If he's meant to die, he'd leap. And if he wasn't, then maybe he just dies. Okay, so let's assume he dies then and wasn't meant to die. Yeah. But So he dies as, as Sam as a being extinguished. And what about uh, what The other about person's Frankie? stuck in Sam's body for the rest of their life. Really? I would think so. Okay. I wonder if this point will ever be addressed in the show. Well, I guess we'll find out. Just have to keep watching. Mm. Al realises who Teresa is and outlines the delicate and specific circumstance Sam needs to manufacture in order to leap according to Ziggy's plan. Teresa! This is the little lady you were bingo bango bungling up in the attic, huh? Teresa is the lady that Frankie was whatever in the attic. Oh, this is going to make retrieving you tonight very interesting. Tonight? You're leaving me out tonight? Hmm, at 2228 Greenwich Mean Time. Great. Providing. Here it comes. You follow Ziggy's program. One. At 2215 Greenwich Mean Time, you must plug in a thousand watt hair dryer in a house located at 111 Erie Drive, Buffalo, New York. What? Two, at the designated retrieval time, 22, 22 28, Greenwich time, yeah, yeah, yeah. At that, you must be at the exact same location arrived at yesterday. Don Gino's attic. Don Gino's attic? Whatever. How can I be in Buffalo at 22.15 and, and back in Brooklyn 13 minutes later? I never said it would be easy. Okay, okay, um, I'll get Primo and Segundo to go to Buffalo. You trust your leap to them? I'm trusting you and Ziggy. Three, you must duplicate the event that was occurring when you arrived. In other words, you have to be with whomever was present in that attic. Teresa. And engaged in whatever activity was taking place. She's so hot. 
not buying this either from Al. The final part about Sam having to do exactly what he was doing before, and I, I think Al was at it. For a start, he'd already, whatever was happening had finished before Sam leapt in. Correct. Um, and uh, it seems like Al's sort of joke. Or he's a dirty little rascal who just wants to see Teresa. Yeah, maybe. I also don't understand why yeah, all these, all of a sudden, everything has to be so specific. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. One other thing, they were having this whole conversation on a busy New York street and Sam wasn't pretending to be on the phone or... Yeah, folk would think he's nuts. nuts yeah. No one even, if you watch in the background, no one bats an eyelid. Now you could say that, you know, it's one of these things like, oh, in, America, in, in New York, everyone's just so... Uh, no one cares about what you do. But yeah. even, I, I don't buy that. I mean, someone would be thinking, why is this maniac talking you know to himself could have earpods yep these yes. days i do feel a bit like that when you when i'm on the phone you know you're walking I and mean, you've got you're chatting away to someone on the phone and you do still feel a bit like uh, sam yeah yeah he's 50 years too soon mm -hmm. we are now in the car with a primo who has borrowed a hair dryer from Teresa, and his brother seconda doesn't really understand why he has got it and what they have to do but primo tells him frankie says to bring it so that's that. Indeed. Meanwhile, Teresa takes a call from Sam. Yeah, she is surprised but delighted that he still wants to see her. But she's a bit shocked at his suggestion that they meet in Don Gino's attic. Well, you would be. Yeah. However, she's up for it. And well, when she... he tells her that she's better there than anywhere else. Yes. And if he's lying, he's dying. <laughs> she agrees. And then we suddenly jump ahead to them in the attic. Yes, but it's a sharp cut and they're finishing the conversation about how awesome she was behind a, a furnace and this is a term she's unfamiliar with. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. She it's likes it though. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? You never really thought that the term awesome wasn't used until recently in that context. Yeah. Unfortunately, they've been spotted. Yes. Gino sits in his car outside the salon whilst his right-hand man passes on the treacherous news that he saw them both climb up into the attic and so a furious godfather promises he is going to teach them respect as he attaches a silencer to his gun yeah over in buffalo the chuckle brothers i've got dumb and dumber okay <laughs> they're in the middle of a, a row of frat houses trying to work out where they're meant to go yeah back to the attic at the same time sam interrupts their awesomeness by asking Teresa what the time is and she's not happy but he tells her that it is important to their future. Yeah, because he wants to put her life at risk to help himself. <laughs> she obviously assumes it's about stars being in the right places, which he is happy for her to believe. Yeah, he talks about Betelgeuse. Yeah. Which may have already um, exploded. Really? Yeah, we won't know. Good movie, that. But when it um, does, when we see the light of the, the Nova, It'll light up Earth for about a week. Will it? Apparently. In 300 years time? Well, it could already have happened, we don't know. Right, there we go. He uses his knowledge to his advantage. He takes her to the window where he impresses her with this chat. She thinks they look like a diamond. and I think there's a nice little uh, look here. Diamond obviously signifies engagement. Right, okay. Yes, anyway, she thinks these uh, stars have to be aligned and he tells her that it's got to be aligned at uh, 2228 GMT. Which she needs translated into American time. 528 EST. It's quite early for the stars to be out. Yeah, I mean, at five, it must be, in, must be in winter. I guess so. And at this point she points out... It's November, we know it's November. They said at the start. Would that be the usual time to have a, a wedding then? Who knows? You wouldn't have an outside wedding at... If it's getting dark, it... it must be quite early that they had the wedding. Yeah, it doesn't... Yeah, people don't have outside weddings in the winter. Unless it's deliberately meant to be, you know, a nighttime wedding. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Anyway, she points out that it is now a quarter past and invites him to get started. Mm. <laughs> Up in Buffalo. Primo gets into a little altercation with a, a frat boy and with the help of his sidearm, is allowed to plug in his hairdryer. Now, Segundo is very nervous in the car. I'm not sure why. They're not doing anything particularly... I mean, these are a couple of uh, hitmen or gangsters or mobsters, right? Yeah. And they're up in a, in a, a frat house area. And he's really like... I think he's nervous because he doesn't know why they're there and what the purpose of this is. 
Sure, but he knows he's not doing anything yeah. illegal here. Doesn't, that doesn't seem natural to me. Okay. Yeah. Once the third gets plugged in and turned on, there's an immediate effect. Yeah, there's a power surge and there's sparks, uh, and then the, the, the power in the street is cut. Up in the attic, it seems that Sam and Teresa heard something, but Teresa's insisting it's just her zipper. <laughs> yes. Now, could, I mean, Buffalo to would Sam have, he no. couldn't have seen this. No. Is it maybe just Sam detecting it through... It's maybe just, yeah, he's nervous about something, I don't know. He's anticipating something happening. In any case, he then kills the mood by... <laughs> Talking about his gran. Yeah, <laughs> and bingo. And is disgusted to discover uh, from Teresa that it is his job to coerce the, the bingo priest into making sure that Nona wins. She's confused about his uh, behaviour and so he decides to come clean and admit that he is not the Frankie that she knows. I could never... I could never stand outside of Luigi's fish market blowing holes in the Giacani brothers. Or make love to you behind the furnace at St. Francis or even cheat at bingo. And if I can't do any of those things, I can't lie to you either. Why stop now? What do you mean? Frankie. I know you lie to me. All men lie to me. They always have. They tell me what I want to hear so they can get what they want. It's life. That's wrong. You deserve better than that, Teresa. Why? Because I can cut hair? For starters, it's a gift. A talent that makes you special. You got a lot of things that make you special, Teresa. You're pretty, you're sweet. Oh, thank you. Don't say it unless you mean it. I don't know about the old Frankie, but this Frankie is telling you. You're special, Teresa. You're very special. God help me, I believe you. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, I thought that was a a genuine, very believable performance. Yeah, but no matter how often he's told not to, Sam is obsessed with confessing who he is. You're just going to seem like a maniac. You, no one's going to believe you that... Yes, I'm just possessing his body. Sorry. I'll be gone soon oh, once yeah. I've fixed my wrong. Yeah, this is not an approach you should ever think is it's viable. A, he just literally can't bring himself to act like a different person sometimes <laughs> if he doesn't approve of all their morals or their values yep. he has to say oh no I, I know he was bopping you behind the furnace but I, I'm different now I couldn't do that you're only causing trouble for the person who's got to leap back in yeah. are you saying all this sort yeah. of stuff there's no need there's no benefit to it at this point yeah this, this is again this is Sam he'd be well saying oh and actually I love Donna yeah <laughs> yeah no, it's causing causing all sorts of problems by, by doing this. Stick as, as strictly and rigidly as you can to that person's persona. Or don't go time travelling. Exactly. If don't. you're not willing to do it. Yep. Again, it's all his own faultless. Yeah. A little sympathy. Exactly. We get a weird shot in a purple. They didn't need this. Well, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure. I, I think it's showing the, the scale of the, the problem. It's not a localised to one street or one little town. Yeah. Okay. It's a major... Yeah, we're in a, a power plant... As, as they kiss, Sam and, and Teresa kiss, we cut to this power plant where the workers witness the eastern seaboard cities plunge into darkness one after a domino effect. Yeah. Meanwhile, Gino shows up in the attic armed with his silenced revolver. Yeah. Each of them tries to take the blame to save the other, but Gino is not for listening. And Sam has to make a grab for him and he wrestles him to the floor. Right at that moment, he is... Or the retrieval attempt by Ziggy leaps Sam out of Frankie's body. But not into a new adventure. No, no, he, he turns out to leap into Gino. Yeah, that's... Mm. So, as the real Frankie tries to now lie his way out of the situation and comes and come to terms with what has happened, and Sam... Makes, he makes no reference to having just spent a week in well, the future. I don't think they, they can know this, because... They, Surely they can. If if this if each of these leap uh, victims 
goes back in. Yeah. They're going to start talking. Exactly. And it's going to, the, the, the space time continuum and history is going to be irrevocably changed. Yeah, well, what can we say? Anyway. So yeah. no, that's what I've, I've noted here. Okay, so Sam realises that he still has got something to do uh, as Don Gino, right? So the loop's yeah. not finished. But this person doesn't remember anything. No, and he tries to excuse himself. Like, make excuses for why he's in the attic. I'm talking about as in, in, in the bigger picture. Yeah, no, yeah, no, he, the, he the has people, no idea what's going yeah, on. So uh, if you're pulled out your body for Sam to enter, you you cannot... In fact, I think Frankie thinks it's still the day before at the wedding. Yeah, quite possibly, He makes yeah. a comment about the wedding and he's told that was yesterday. Yeah. So he doesn't think, he doesn't realise that time's passed. Maybe he thinks he's had a weird dream. So we've discussed it before. We have to hammer this. The person who Sam leaped into is going to get back into the body without any knowledge of what Sam has done. Yeah. So all the people he's interacted with, all the things that he's said as his own person because he can't control himself, yep. it's causing so much, you know, at best, awkward situations, but potentially disastrous. I mean, it's, it's entirely possible that Frankie just wasn't that into Teresa. Yeah. I mean, it, well, we know that. Al said that. It could be any number. Yeah. And now Sam's tied him in. <sighs> Havoc. Havoc. Anyhow, Sam now drops Gino's gun and tries to ask them whether they, they love each other. Yeah, apparently he understands that he's got to bring Frankie and Teresa together. That's what his, what his goal is. That's what he thinks. He needs to do it in a way that Gino can't back out of when he leaps. Yeah. Teresa is quick and firm in her response. She says, yeah, we love each other. But Frankie tries to be more circumspect before realising it's not a trap set by Gino. Indeed. Sam now speaks out loud to himself about the problem he faces as you mentioned there he's got to try and allow this relationship to progress yep in such a way that when Gino leaps back in he can't uh, it. reverse yeah. it yeah so again in the waiting room we we must accept that Gino can't can't see what's going on here no and as he's speaking out loud anyway he says he's got to do this so that uh, Frankie doesn't end up like uh, Jimmy Hoffa which, because obviously the, the, the Hoff has not disappeared yet, so Frankie yeah. thinks, oh, what, leading the Teamsters? <laughs> <laughs> but then um, Sam has an epiphany. He does. Where do we head next? Down to the church where the bingo is going on. Where the priest eventually agrees to informally announce the union of the, the two to the gathered bingo players. And I, I think from how they react, they're very, very nervous. So I think that they, it's a sort of open secret or they were aware of this and Maybe. thought, oh, oh, this isn't good. They, well, don't they want certainly them. know that Gino and Teresa were involved. Yes. So they're, they're waiting, thinking, what's going on here? Indeed. Sam then takes the unnecessary step of kicking Frankie out of the family business, saying so he's not to shoot anybody else. Yes. Now, this plan, I don't think it's as good as what Sam thinks it is. So, on the face of it, what, what he's saying here, what he's relying upon is that if Gino has publicly given his ble uh, his blessing to this, it will be hard for him to to walk it back. But as a, a, a mafia don, he can easily have someone else do the dirty work and make it look like an accident. Yeah, no reason to no reason to suspect that this won't prevent Frankie from sleeping with the fishies. No, nope, not at all. Anyway, Sam's also surprised not to leap at this point. Yeah, I quite liked it. He sort of stands back as if saying, my job here is done. Let's go on with it. And nothing happens. And the priest looks at him taking his, his you know, pulling this pose. Yeah. <laughs> Al also shows up at this point and confirms that both plans have failed. Yeah, Al and his uh, winter apparel. Yes, the, the heating's, uh, or the air conditioning's back on. Uh, now that they're not trying to get Sam back anymore. Yeah. He's worried that he's going to be stuck as Juno for 40 years, but Al reassures him. Yeah, that, that won't be the case. Juno's going to be killed in April. Not so good. Well, not no, so good for Gino. It's only five months away. Instead, he tells them that he knows what he has to do and he nods over to the bingo. Sam can't believe this. Yeah, he f takes the, the draw over from the priest, fixes it for Nonna to win, and indeed then leaps. How could he fix it? I think he rubs the number off the ball, it looked like, and then announces the one that he knows Nonna's got. Really? I, I don't think there's any way that he could fix that in that space of a few seconds. Oh. Well, he doesn't actually draw on his ball. Does he not? No, he just... Uh, 
it looked to me like he rubbed the number that was on the ball off. But even if he didn't, he just right. probably puts it back. But in how would he know he, what none of his ball is? He must have observed it on his way. Past. No, that's nonsense. I'm not buying that at all. No, it, it, he won't know what number none needs. Oh. I thought it was maybe just a case of that Gino actually did draw the winning ball. I don't think so. Well, it's just as believable as that he could, in the space of three seconds, work out how to fix this. I mean, that would be like, how how could you do that? Anyway, doesn't matter. It, it does matter. Matters to me. I don't care. Okay. He then leaps into uh, a man in a diner. Yes, an elderly black man sitting at the counter of a diner with a number of disbelieving white people staring quite menacingly at him. And that's the end. Yeah. Looks interesting for next week. Yeah. You've kind of addressed the questions I was going to ask you about how Gino's going to react. Yeah. And how things are going to work out for Frankie and Teresa. Yeah, but again, the interesting thing though is that Sam doesn't care. He could care less about Frankie or Teresa. He just wants out of there. Yep. Al's not giving him any odds. Talked about their future or anything like that. I think from what we've seen now in these six episodes, he is leaving in his in his wake a, a trail of absolute disaster, havoc, and all sorts of things. And his behaviour is incredibly selfish almost all of the time. In fairness, it has to be selfish. His goal is to get him to leap. That's what his primary objective. His objective being here isn't to isn't to solve these problems or put things that are right he wants to go home and he's got to do that to he's got to put these things right to to mm. do that so it is a as a selfish act and the, the very fact that he as we've discussed that he decided to get involved in this in the first place uh, is, it was selfish and and stupid but yeah I, I think that there are major issues with when he leaps out and, and i think it would be good and but perhaps the the, the 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 new show will if it doesn't in the original run We'll, uh, we'll address these points. How do these, you know, it's like, a, let's go a year later, let's return to the lips and see how they got on. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> They're like stabbing at each other and people have been murdered and... Everyone in them is dead. Yeah, all the relation, yeah, relationships like all in, split up. Ramsey's kitchen nightmares, they go back to these restaurants They're all, and they're all shut down. Of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, Sam's leap nightmares, yeah. In terms of things that we learned, so like you mentioned, Al refers to Ziggy as he. Yep. I think that's going to be, not, maybe not hold up. Sam also says he was 10 in November 65, which means he was born between late 54 and November 55, which I think isn't going to hold either. Okay. And we also got further confirmation of Sam being massively selfish. Yes, I also have that uh, Al was in Vietnam. Okay. The person who Sam leaps into can't remember anything, so it's a, we've got a mind blank here. Yeah. And potentially Al grew up in an orphanage or some sort of... Uh, Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? Uh, no additional thoughts. I enjoyed it. Okay. Trivia then? Sure. Originally aired 21st April 1989, directed by Aaron Lipstadt. First of his three episodes in the big chair, he had a prolific directorial career working on shows like The Equalizer, Law and Order SVU and Elementary. He's still active. to be 69 years old. This was a Donald P. Belisario episode. We'll get to him eventually, but not today. Terry Garber played Teresa Apache. This was her only Quantum Leap appearance. She's maybe best known for her work on the North and South miniseries in the 80s. But she's also appeared in shows like Murder, She Wrote, ER, and As the World Turns. She's still actively performing and she's 61 years old. Michael Genovese played Don Gino. This is the first of two appearances on the show. He's also shown up in series like Star Trek The Next Generation, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, The Flash, TJ Hooker, and, and in a recurring role on ER, opposite his wife, Ellen Crawford. He's been in movies like Point Break, Risky Business and Harlem Nights. He's now 80, but he's got no screen credit since 2018, so may well be retired. Joe Santos played Tony. Do you remember which one was Tony? Is that the father? I assume so. Okay, this was his only Quantum Leap role, though he showed up regularly on Magnum P.I., Hardcastle and McCormick, The Rockford Files and The Sopranos, as well as guest spots on shows like Murder, She Wrote, T.J. Hooker and The A-Team. One time Emmy nominee, he died in 2016 when he was 84. Nick Cassavetes played Primo with ah, his Mel Kiper hair. It's a very uh, well known surname. This was his only appearance on the show, but he also showed up in LA Law, Entourage, Crime and Punishment, as well as films like Face Off, Hangover 2, and The Astronaut's Wife. The Columbo Connection here, obviously. Indeed. He's the, he's the son of Gina Rollins and John Cassavetes, who was a long term friend and collaborator of Peter Falk, and who played the killer. The season two episode Etude in Black. And a bit of a, a genius in the, the movie scene. Nick is now 63 years old and he's also still an active performer. 
Tom Salardi played Segundo. This was his only episode of Quantum Leap, but he also appeared in series like Married with Children, ER, NYPD Blue, and Spin City, as well as films like I Now Pronounce You, Chuck and Larry, and Bull Durham. He's got no screen credit since 2007, and the internet is not able to clarify whether he's still performing or indeed alive. We can only hope. Paige Mosley played Frankie at the end and also in Reflections. This was his only Quantum Leap role, but he also appeared in shows like Sledgehammer. Yeah, he, he was Rocket in Sledge Rattle and Roll. Okay. He was in Beverly Hills 90210. He was in Melrose Place, but he hasn't acted since 1996 on screen. Apparently gave up around about that time to work as a financial agent in Van Nuys, California. Harriet Medin played Mama. Do you remember her? No. Maybe it's Nonna. That's Nonna. It's listed as Mama. Okay. Anyway, this was her only quantum leap role. She was in movies like The Witches of Eastwick, The Terminator and Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead, playing minor roles. And she also showed up in series like Northern Exposure and The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. She died in 2005 at the age of 91. That makes sense that she would be known. Mm -hmm. Mark Margolis played Adriano, the sidekick. He was Emmy nominated for his work on Breaking Bad. This was his only episode of Quantum Leap though. He was also on shows like Star Trek The Next Generation, Law and Order, Better Call Saul, and one episode of Columbo. Oh, which one? He played Cosner in Columbo Cries Wolf. Ah. Additionally, he's a frequent collaborator with the director Darren Aronofsky. He's appeared in a number of his films, including Pie and Black Swan. He's still performing now at the age of 82. Dean Fortunato played Father Sebastian. He wasn't in it very much, but this was his only Quantum Leap role. He also appeared in some of your favourite shows like Seinfeld, Doogie Howser MD, hmm. Ellen and Murder One. He's now 62 years old, but doesn't appear to be acting anymore. Finally, John Hostetter played Bert. I think that was the, maybe the other sidekick. Mm. This was his only episode of Quantum Leap, but he was otherwise quite prolific, showing up in series like Ellie Law, Cagney and Lacey, Matlock, Murder, She Wrote, Murphy Brown and ER. And he died in 2016 when he was 69. You've previously mentioned Dean Stockwell appearing in Married to the Mob. As it turns out, there's some striking similarities between the scenario his character faced in that movie Sam's situation in this one. It's, it's similar sort of ideas in terms of messing with the wrong woman and, and rival mob And the families. names of the characters. And literally the actual names <laughs> of most of the characters. Okay. The real Northeast blackout, which occurred on this date in November 1965, was due to a 230 kilovolt transmission line near Ontario being tripped, causing other heavily loaded lines to fail, leading to a surge of power that overwhelmed the lines in western New York and there was a sort of cascade of failures. 30 million people in eight states and two Canadian provinces were affected. Not the only New York blackout. I listened to a documentary, I think it's on YouTube actually just now, uh, about the 1977. Right. Yeah, it was uh, it's quite interesting. This one was huge but it was restored, power was restored by the following morning. This episode won an Emmy for its hairstyling, presumably <laughs> for a primo. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Or maybe for Teresa's work. Yeah. Who knows? Uh, can't overlook the musical Columbo Connection. No. Nope. We talked about this briefly earlier on. Al teaches Sam to sing Valari, obviously. But uh, in the Columbo episode, Troubled Waters, Dean Stockwell was the member of a band that played Valari on a cruise ship. Over and over again. Indeed. It went on for a long time, that. Notoriously. Yeah. Next week, we have The Colour of Truth, where Sam has to battle prejudice to save a life. So we will see you in 1955. Until then, cheerio. Bye bye.